Thank you, Dr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Chairman, for the introduction. So, I'll be talking to you this afternoon about non infidelity and influence trials. My name is uh, Vikram Gota. I'm the Professor of uh, People Controversy at Access Academic Center. And I'm also the founder of the Consortium for Those Optimization. And these are our uh, websites that you can uh, upload to uh, to see what kind of uh, work we do. Uh, and I don't have uh, anything to declare. So, just to give you an overview of uh, my talk, I'll be talking you through the definitions of equivalence and the trials, hypothesis in each of these uh, situations, what are the needs for NA trials, design, choosing the margin, analysis, and conclusions. So, actually, definition, I don't have to read the definition. Uh, an NA trial or an equivalence trial is nothing but a, uh, 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 a randomized controlled trial or whatever, with some kind of a margin. Okay, so what we think is here you will be showing that whatever difference you observe lies within a certain margin because if it goes beyond the certain margin, it will not be accessible. Now, you might wonder, like for example, when I say that you know, when I'm doing an equivalence trial, equivalence trial, the drug the treatment cannot exceed the effect of other treatment by a certain margin. R cannot be inferior to the effect of uh, uh, control by certain margin. So you might wonder why is it so? Why should it not exceed? Okay, what is the harm in exceeding? Okay, so now when that kind of a question comes, see, you understood, no? So we have a line of no difference, and then for an equivalent side, we have done two margins one on the left side, one on the right side. And I am saying that whatever treatment effect we are showing with the intervention, okay, it should not go beyond. Either of the margins. It should not be too good, also, it should not be too bad, also. Now, can you, can you even uh, you know, uh, imagine that, try right, to answer on what conditions you may not want the treatment to be better than the existing treatment? Why do you think it is important that it is not better than the existing treatment? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good answer, but in the what context? Uh, maybe there is an improvement in PS, but it does not translate into this. So your slides are not moving. No, no, that's because I'm not moving the slides. <laughs> okay. So under what context? I mean, too much toxicity, I understand. But uh, why? when does that happen? When do you think it might happen? Okay. So anyway, uh, for the later of time, I'll just move ahead. So one of the Important indications for which we do equivalence trial is for bioequivalence. And what do you mean by bioequivalence? When you have a generic trial and when you do the pharmacokinetics, you want to show that the pharmacokinetics is not the exposure, let us say, in the curve, is not way too high or way too low. If it's way too high, it can cause toxicities. If it is way too low, it can cause therapeutic failures. So those are some of the situations. In which we want to do an equivalent spread. Of course, there are other situations also which I come to later. Okay, and of course, non infinity has its own place. I mean, it is a very important trial design, and I'll talk to you more in detail about that. So, we'll talk to you about the design of uh, how to design a inferiority and non infinity trial, the need, and how to choose a margin. So, I told you, you know, in equivalent trial or non infinity, you have margins. Okay, in equivalent trial, there are two margins. And you know, uh, in the non trial, they have one margin. So, how do you choose that margin? And why is that margin so important? And how do you analyze the data? And how do you compute the data? Okay, now this definition is not so important, but I will still, uh, still uh, read it nevertheless. Non infinity trials aim to demonstrate that an experimental treatment or procedure is not worse, both statistically and clinically, than an active control by more than a margin. So that is easy to understand. So if you want to bring in something, and if you cannot demonstrate that it is superior, at least what you want to show is it is not inferior by other So that is fairly understandable. These trials are conducted when, when some modest reduction in efficacy may be acceptable. So it is a kind of trade-off. Okay. Okay. I don't mind losing efficacy as long as okay I have get secondary benefits such as. A reduction in the adverse events, reduction in the cost, improvement in quality of life. So, if we say, okay, uh, 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 patients on Olaparin may say, uh, survey for about 10 months, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, epigenetic uh, cancer. But I have a drug which may not, uh, you know, uh, uh, take a survival in ten months. It is about nine months. So I'm losing the survival advantage of that month, but I don't mind as long as it gives me free of adverse effects. It improves my quality of life. As long as I can go out, play, play, and so on. So if you have those kind of second advantages, but you think that it may not do better than the, uh, the conventional treatment or the standard treatment, then you should refer to the therapy. Likewise, equivalent stress, I think I have already given you a heads up. Equivalent stress are connected to demonstrate that efficacy of two drugs or interventions differ by no more than a specific amount. So, no more than, no more or no less. Okay, so it could be on both sides. Okay, no more or no less. The null hypothesis is A is not equal to B. Okay, so A is not equal to B is the hypothesis that you start with. And you, if you reject that, you will prove that A is equal to B, which means that equivalent. Okay, so null hypothesis A is equal to A is not equal to B, and the such hypothesis then the alternate is A is equal to B is uh, interesting equivalence or simply simply those of a conventional comparative study reverse. So so okay, I understand no. So in a conventional comparative study, this will be your uh, Null hypothesis that you know there is no difference. Okay, this is a null hypothesis, and it will get uh, you know alternate hypothesis the, the two are not equal. But in the equal study, this is your null and this is your alternate. So it is just that you know they get reversed. Okay. In practice, the word equivalence cannot be expressed as equal or same. So you can it is not as when you say equivalence. They are the same. It is not like that. You cannot say that you know the two treatments are same. It is just that the the, the intervention as compared to the comparator is no better or no worse. Okay, you cannot conclude. This is very important. When you demonstrate this correlation, you cannot conclude that they are same. You can only conclude that it is no better or no worse than the conventional treatment. So this is semantics, but it is very important to understand because otherwise. You will go, go wrong. I mean, if you keep on believing that a uh, new treatment, when you demonstrate equivalence, is the same as the old treatment, then you may make a lot of mistakes going forward. You do subsequent equivalence tests, and a phenomenon called biotrip will come into place. I'll talk to you about biotrip, and that is when you understand that no, it is not, the two treatments are not the same. It is just that these are better or worse. Okay? So, a uh, margin of delta plus or minus is the maximum clinically acceptable difference that one is willing to accept in return for secondary benefits. So, that we already understood. Okay, now just to understand the hypothesis a little better. So, this is the traditional superiority trial that uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Supriya was talking about, wherein you say that in null hypothesis, there is no difference between the two different terms. They are, they are same. And then you reject the null hypothesis and just say that you know one treatment is better than the other. In equivalence, if you look at it, the null hypothesis is reversed, the therapies are not equivalent. And then when you, when you disprove that, or when you reject the null hypothesis, you say that the new treatment is equivalent to the current treatment. And likewise, if you look at non equivalency the hypothesis says the new treatment is inferior to the current treatment. Okay, because it's not a fair trial, you want to believe, you start with that by believing that it's inferior, but when you disprove that another hypothesis, you will accept the uh, other hypothesis that it is not inferior. It is not inferior. It is not inferior. Okay. So that's about this. I mean, just uh, just imagine how, just uh, observe how the hypothesis is flipped from a traditional comparative study to a equivalence. Okay. Now, me, I think you know, I've already discussed you know, uh, when you have a drug which is kind of uh, new, but you are not very sure that you know it can be superior to the existing treatment, but you are pretty much certain that you know it can offer some second advantages in cost, uh, uh, quality of life, or duration of treatment, or convenience to the patient in terms of compliance, whatever advantage you may be talking about. So, then you will do this. Now, so if you look at this uh, cartoon, it will clearly establish what constitutes 
the uh, the line of no difference, and then the margins on the left hand side and the right hand side, which is the margin which uh, you know the inferiority margin because below that the drug will be inferior. The superiority margin because below that it will be it will not be in the equal criteria, and the zone of equivalence. So this this area is called as the zone of equivalence, and then you can see from this example. That the, if you have a situation like in the first example, uh, where the constant interval lies within the margin, you will compute equivalence. Second example is once again the same thing. The only difference is being that the estimate is on the left hand side, uh, side of the uh, uh, line of no difference, which means in the first example, the point estimate may be favoring the conventional treatment. In the second example, the point estimate may be favoring the intervention. But nevertheless, both of them are equivalent because. The outer bound of the constant intervals are within the zone of equivalence. And the third other example is definitely not uh, equivalent because the outer bound is crossing the margin here. So that is why you cannot control equivalence. And at, at the same time, you can also conclude that it is inferior because the outer bound here is outside the like it is not straddling uh, the line of no difference. So therefore, this can be. Included as inferior, and likewise, this one, what will you control? So, this is once again not equivalent because this is crossing the margin, so you cannot control equivalence, but this is better than the line of no, uh, no, no difference, therefore, you will conclude significant. And the fifth example, once again, they, it, is, it is not equivalent for sure, okay, because the outer bound is. Uh, <coughs> Going beyond the uh, this one, so it is not equivalent. But you can conclude non-inferiority because the uh, this is the non-inferiority margin, so it is within the non-inferiority margin. So okay, so these are some of the ways in which you now for the interpretation of the data, these are the situations that you can actually end up in, and therefore you should know what can you possibly control under various circumstances. Okay. So the delta is chosen in such a way that you know what is the margin that is clinically acceptable to say that okay, even if a new treatment is inferior, uh, up to what extent can it tolerate the inferiority? That is uh, that is how we choose the delta. So to define it, maximum maximum clinically acceptable difference that one is willing to accept is it is for the secondary benefits of delta. Okay, because when the uh, new therapy has secondary benefits, but if it is way too inferior, then there is no point. I mean, you do not want to take that forward. Okay, so now what are the benefits and limitations of the equivalent study? Okay, now let us look at this. So, useful in confirming the absence of clinically meaningful difference between the two groups. Okay, that is fairly simple. And extrapolation of findings to other indications of current therapy. Like, for example, uh, some time ago, we did an equivalent study of uh, rituximab. Okay? And then uh, there was this rituximab from uh, uh, Roche, okay? which was the standard. And we also had the rituximab from Brindis, which is called the Ditex. Okay? And then we demonstrated that the Ditex is bio equivalent to Raptera. Raptera, which is the uh, Roche drug. Okay? So now, in which indication did we do the study? We did the study in diffuse large basal lymphoma. But now, is the inference just enough for the diffuse large basal lymphoma or it can be taken to other indications of uh, like rheumatoid arthritis? Possibly, you can take it to other indications of rheumatoid like arthritis also. So, therefore, if you demonstrate equivalence for one indication, the chances are that you may be able to extrapolate the conclusion to other indications of the drug as well. I mean, there will be certain caveats for this rule. But by and large, we will be able to extrapolate other implications of the drug. Okay? And change in standard, so what are the limitations? If there are changes in standard of care, it will make demonstration of equivalence a So suppose I demonstrate uh, today equivalence of some treatment to femcarbo in like cancer. Okay? But if tomorrow, say, if femcarbo is replaced by, let's say, uh, uh, osimertinib, I mean, it's for the sake of discussion, then demonstrating equivalence of this drug to femcarbo is meaningless. Because the world has moved on. Okay? So that is the problem. And biogrip is another thing that we should uh, worry about. That is why I say that when you demonstrate equivalence, you should not think in your mind that they are safe. It is not safe. 
It is just that it is no worse or no better. Because when you say in your demonstration equivalence, this is definitely on the higher, better side. This is on the inferior side. Your drug may be here. Okay? But still your approval equivalence. Okay? Now, this is A, this is B. Now you have a drug C. Okay? And then you are assuming that this is as good as uh, A, and then you do an equal study of C with uh, B. Then what happens? You C may land up here. Okay? Then what happens? The difference between C to A will be so much. You understand now? That phenomena is called as biograde, and therefore, we should never make the mistake of assuming that they are same. Okay? And that is one thing I am trying to emphasize again today. Okay? And uh, let us try to understand step by step how we will we can plan. Uh, uh, equivalence trial. So, we will take an example of uh, three studies. One is non opioid versus opioid analgesia for hospital discharge following cesarean delivery, a randomized equivalence trial. So, once again, we will discuss as to what is the control here, what is the intervention here, why was uh, the control necessary, you know, uh, what was the margin therapy and all those things in the subsequent trials. So, the second example is long term primary results of accelerated partial breast irradiation after breast conserving therapy for early stage breast cancer the random is control okay. okay so results of accelerated partial breast irradiation okay so that is we are trying to demonstrate the equivalence of that with conventional breast irradiation and the third example is effect of infusion set replacement intervals on catheter related bloodstream infections a randomized controlled equivalence and not entirely for two different conditions. Okay, they are trying to show equivalence for central venous axis device and non inferiority for a peripheral arterial catheter, both in a single study. So, the reason why we have chosen this, uh, I've chosen these examples is just to demonstrate that what are the situations in which you can do an equivalence trial and also to prove the fact that in a single trial, you can answer two questions of both equivalence as well as non inferiority, depending on how you define the study. Okay. So now, in each of these problems, uh, situations, you may have to rule out superiority design. And when you, how do you rule out superiority design? If you think that, see, like for example, I mean, I mean, it is kind of uh, intuition. Okay, if I am going to replace a five-day antibody with a three-day antibody, the chances are that the three-day is not going to show. I mean, the chances. Okay, I mean, what happens is a different thing. The chances are that the three-day is unlikely to be superior to five. So under those circumstances, there is no point doing a superiority study. Understood, no? So that is where you have to rule out the possibility of a superiority. If the drug is unlikely to show that it is going to be superior, then there is no point doing a superiority. And then advantages you should have. Three days versus five days, suddenly there is an advantage. Okay? If you three days, they will improve on compliance, the cost will decrease, and so on and so forth. So there is suddenly advantage. Okay? Uh, why superiority is not desirable? Once again, we have discussed uh, that because you may not be able to demonstrate superiority. And failure to establish uh, uh, superiority sometimes, like for example, if you compare a 3 antibiotic with a 5 antibiotic and fail to demonstrate that, uh, superiority, it will grant 3 as a failure. But that may not necessarily be the case because it may still be non inferior or equivalent. Okay, now how do you uh, choose uh, uh, control treatment? In most of these trials, control treatment, how will you choose? Like for example, I have a treatment B, which is a new intervention. And then there is treatment A, it is standard of K. So, how do I choose the so intervention we know? Intervention is B. But how do we choose the control? Can you pick any control? No. And the answer is you have to pick the control which is standard of K for that uh, particular indication. And preferably, the standard of care should have proven superiority over a placebo control for the given application. Okay, preferably you should have data showing the superiority of the conventional treatment against a placebo control. Okay, so superiority factor control over earlier uh, uh, standard of care or a placebo control or earlier standard of care. So whatever active control you are taking, you should have demonstrated either superiority over placebo or an earlier standard of care. The dose in dosage regime is able to exactly mimic. In the, in the study that showed superiority of your standard of care to the earlier uh, standard 
whatever dose and duration and everything of use, you should be able to use the same dose and duration for this uh, equivalence or non inverting Okay, now how do you select a margin? So, whenever you uh, select a margin for an equivalence trial, the margin is more or less clinically driven. Like, for example, what amount of uh, you know, uh, compromise I am willing to settle. I gave an example of 10 months of the 10 months for molecular or molecular better new treatment. Okay. So, that one month is it okay? Or can you switch up to 1.5 months? Or even is two months also okay? What kind of secondary advantages uh, we are getting? And do the secondary advantages far outweigh the loss of uh, uh, you know, advantage for, for the primary outcome? All those things will come into consideration. But if you, if you choose a, a margin too narrow, what happens? Okay, in any trial, uh, in a trial, if you choose a margin too narrow, then what happens is your sample size will increase tremendously and the trial will become non starter because you are trying to show a very uh, you know, equivalence within a very narrow margin. And whenever the margin is small, the sample size will definitely increase because in more in superior trial, uh, in equivalence trial, as well as in non uh, 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 inferior trial, the sample size is driven largely by the margin. But then, okay, if you don't want to make the margin too small, let me just expand the margin and make it very big from 10 months to 5 months. Okay, so then if your new treatment sits at about 5.5 months, are you confident enough to kind of uh, use that in your patient? You may not be. Okay, so then that will make the demonstration of uh, equivalence redundant. So, therefore, there is a clinical call as to what the margin should be as far as the equivalence value is concerned. Okay. And uh, finally, can both equivalence and non non-infinite non hypothesis be tested in a single trial? The answer is yes. And just to give an example, they have a third trial where you know they have uh, used a various uh, duration of replacement of uh, the catheter, and they are trying to demonstrate equivalence in one setting where patients have used uh, uh, a central venous access device, and they are trying to demonstrate non-infinite in another setting where patients are using peripheral like uh, arterial catheter. Okay, so. I mean, anything is possible. So the trials, see, the trials can be very, very adaptive. I mean, provided you kind of are very clear as to what you want to show. And uh, as long as you maintain some kind of a strict control over your practices and, uh, you know, inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, uh, and then, you know, the boundaries, um, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, the conduct of the trial and everything. So you can actually play with the outcomes and endpoints in, in whatever way you want. So that you know you can try to get a maximum of the effect in the because you're investing a lot of time, you're investing a lot of resources. It is not as though you can answer only one question in the Yes. For beginners, if you're doing the clinical trial, I suggest that you don't just take one simple question, try to answer that. But other as you grow uh, uh, the more and more experience in clinical trials, you know, you should make your clinical trials as efficient as, as efficient as possible. So, what kind of secondary uh, endpoint that I can uh, I can add to the primary endpoint? What are the different questions that I can answer in the same thing that is another consideration? Okay. Now, so in equivalence, because there are two margins, no, you use what are called as two one-sided tests. Okay. You will test for significance on the left hand side, you will test for significance on the right hand side. <laughs> so obviously, when you are testing for significance on both the sides, you will get two three values. Okay, one p value may be 0 0.04, one p value may be 0 0.06. Let us say. So now, if the highest of the p value is not less than 0 0.05, then you cannot conclude equivalence. Okay, so which means the highest of the two p values should be less than 0 0.05 or whatever uh, you know level of significance that you are trying to show. Okay, so that is called as two one-sided test. And there are also some uh, debate on whether you should do an intention metric analysis or per protocol analysis. This is a very interesting uh, topic. I'll give you just one example, one situation to show the difference between intention metric and per protocol. Just uh, you know, a little bit careful. When you're doing a superiority trial, okay, you want to show that one treatment is better than the or uh, the two treatments are not the same. This is different. Okay. So then, what happens is, under those situations, you will you would want to do an intention to treat analysis. Okay, why? No, no. Why? What is it? 
No, 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 it's not about generalism. So you want to do intensity to treat analysis in that the those circumstances because you are trying to show that there is a difference between the two treatments. So therefore, your approach should be your uh, approach to the trial should be such that a tool which will try to show that there is no difference. Okay. Intensity to treat analysis is a very conservative analysis. It happens. It follows what happens in practice. In practice, what happens? People, you know, if they don't feel like waking up in the morning, they will not come for follow up. You know, then you will have a censoring in the event. You know, then uh, you know a, 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 they may kind of uh, just opt out. They may miss treatment for three to five days or whatever. So all these things, what happens is it will try to minimize the difference between the two treatments. Okay. So, but but still, in intensity analysis, what you are going to do? You are going to analyze the patient as randomized. In whatever way they are randomized, you want to analyze whether they follow the protocol or not. Okay. So therefore, ITT is a very conservative tool that tries to show that there is no difference between the treatment. And in spite of that, if you show that you know A is better than B, then perhaps A is actually better than B. Okay. So you must understand that ITT is a very conservative method of analysis. Now we just reverse it. In a equivalence trial, you want to show that the two treatments are similar. And if you use an ITT analysis, you are actually favoring that uh, conclusion. So therefore, you should go the reverse way and do a per protocol analysis. You understood, now? So this is the single most difference between why you do an index analysis in a superiority trial, superiority trial uh, versus why you do a per protocol analysis in a non-superiority or a equal spread. But ITT is so ingrained in all of us that you know people will not accept without an ITT analysis. So therefore, when you are doing a intensity, uh, when you are doing a equal stress or a or a non equal stress non inferiority trial, you have to show you have to demonstrate non inferiority both by per protocols as well as ITT analysis. Okay, I have one example where. You know the per protocol analysis shows that you know uh, the two treatments are not uh, uh, non inferior, not non inferior. Okay, but the intention to treat analysis shows that you know it is non inferior. Okay, so then you know you may carry a wrong message home. If you think if you demonstrate that non inferior, you may start using B uh, interchangeably with A. But the ITT shows that it is non inferior, but the per protocol says that it is not non inferior, which means you cannot replace the two. Like what? Yeah, Generally, it doesn't happen because of the philosophy of uh, ITT and that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, I mean, this is just like, I mean, in the sense, you know, uh, various steps that are involved in uh, uh, doing these studies recognize a research problem. Okay. So, I'll just take one example. There is one research problem of and opioids, opioids, you know, are drugs of abuse. You know, there can be dependency and all those things. So you want to replace opioids with something else if possible. So that is a clinical problem. Now, uh, what is the selection, uh, selection treatment? Till then, perhaps the opioids for the standard of uh, care for cesarean section for post uh, uh, post cesarean recovery. Now you want to so show whether you can use uh, NSAIDs. Okay, that becomes your intervention. And what are the secondary advantages? All the uh, disadvantages of opioids can be overcome with uh, prescribing a non opioid uh, 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 you know, NSAIDs. So, that is, it can reduce the potential for abuse and overdose. And then, margin selection, once again, as I said, you know, you can use uh, certain clinical judgment to set the margin. And uh, here, uh, we have because uh, cesarean recovery pain is the important thing. So, they have taken a plus or minus uh, uh, pain score. So, the pain of uh, uh, 10 uh, whatever units on the visual analog scale, they are taken as the margin. And they have done both intention to treat analysis and per protocol analysis. And likewise, there are other examples also. But this is the uh, this is the flow of thought when you are doing either an equivalence or another non security. Okay, so these are the results. So as you can see, this is the margin, and you can see that both the intention to treat analysis and the per protocol analysis they are kind of not equivalent. So therefore, this doesn't support the equivalence hypothesis. And likewise, here as well, 
Here you should know that you know it is uh, we are taking a ratio. Here there is a difference. Okay, a minus b. So therefore it is zero. But here it is some kind of a ratio. Therefore the line of no difference is at one. Okay, and then the margin is fifty. So one point five times. So this is point six six. One point five times of point six six is one. Okay, one point five times of one is one point five. Okay, and that is how we have set the equivalence uh, margin. And once again, you have demonstrated that you know both my per protocol and the different the equivalence uh, criteria is not met. And on this note is that whenever you are doing a intention tree analysis versus a per protocol, the point estimate is more closer to the line of uh, uh, no difference in the ITT analysis as compared to the per protocol analysis. Okay. And in this example, of course, for the PAC. They could demonstrate non-inferiority because that's what they wanted to do. They could demonstrate non-inferiority because non this is a non-inferiority margin. But for the CDAD, and the, this is what I was telling you. For the intention to treat analysis, it was meeting the equivalence criteria. But for the per protocol analysis, it was not meeting the intention to treat. You clearly see, you know, how the point estimate has shifted when you do a per protocol analysis. Here also, everything is shifted. So in per protocol, everything shifts to the right because it tends to show that there is no difference. Okay. Okay. And now I am coming to another trial uh, because on this one we we discuss about the but there is not much different. I mean conceptually they are very safe. So demonstrate that you know the external treatment is not inferior, and they have secondary benefits, and then you uh, unlike people in soil, NA has only one margin on one side. Okay, it doesn't have two margins, and. Uh, Outcomes of interest can be success rates or failure rates. So this is kind of interesting because if you are doing an NA trial and then say that NA has a success rate of fifty percent, then I am willing to take a meeting of ten percent for drug B. Uh, you know, even if it is inferior to ten percent, it is okay. So whenever you are talking about uh, positive uh, outcomes like success rates, okay. You are not inferior by much, and we are on the negative side. Minus ten. I accept. So fifty is my cutoff. I accept minus ten. Okay. Whenever you are talking about failure rates, the failure rates of a certain drug is seventy percent. I am willing to accept a failure rate of eighty percent. So then you have to add. So from minus seventy to minus eighty. So you have to add ten. So that is how the margins are. So uh, benefits helps to compare an intervention which has secondary benefits. That's known. In circumstances where assigning patients to a placebo or unethical use of non-inferiority trial design can be handy. Like for example, uh, you have a new treatment, okay, and uh, so there is already a standard of care. You know that the new treatment uh, can be better than uh, placebo, but you know you cannot use a placebo control in the this one trial because there is already a standard of care. At the same time, we also know that you know the new treatment may not be better than the, uh, the standard, but may have certain advantages. So that is why you cannot use a classical control trial. That's why you settle for a non-inferiority trial. Okay, clinical equipoise is necessary. So you, uh, when you start start out, it is important to know the, uh, have a understanding that both treatments may be equally good. So that is how you start up any clinical trial for this matter. Biocreep I already uh, referred. So A is a non-inferior. If you use this as a standard for the next one, there could be, there could be bio creep. If the effect of standard treatment is very close to placebo, so when the, effect, the standard treatment itself is very close to placebo, and if you are demonstrating non-inferiority with respect to the uh, standard, then you know you are trying to be as good as the placebo. So that is something should be very well done. Okay. Once again, a similar step-by-step -step approach. Uh, you know, we have taken uh, three studies. Okay, one is a vaccine study where you know we want to show that you know the patients who are on chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and uh, uh, radiotherapy, if they are getting vaccinated, their immune responses are not different from non-cancer uh, controls. Okay, so that is one study, and then discontinuing beta-lactam antibodies after three days for patients with community-acquired pneumonia is non uh, is is not inferior to uh, conventional uh, duration of treatment. And then the third type of the third study is hyperfractionation versus conventional fractionation 
both domestic time and radio therapy for patients with high risk breast cancer. And once again, the randomized non equated trial, where we are showing that hypofractionation is not inferior to uh, conventional fraction. Okay, so in all these cases, you don't at least when you start, you don't expect these treatments to be uh, better than the uh, standard. So you have some kind of uh, equipoise that okay, both may be either good or one may be non inferior, but it cannot be non inferior by margin. So that is when that's, that's the hypothesis with which you start the study. And then you have identified a research problem because uh, conventional fractionation requires too many fractions to be delivered, so we can finish the patient so whether we can hypofractionate. Final antibiotic or conventional is too long, so whether you can reduce the duration of antibiotic uh, treatment. And the third one is kind of interesting, but then you don't have a choice. So, but here I want to see whether in the COVID in the cancer patients can give COVID vaccination, well, I, whether I get a same kind of response as I get in uh, non cancer patients. So, those are some of the problems that we have identified. And margin selection I'll come to later. Okay, so margin selection in the non federal is a little interesting because there are multiple statistics involved in it. So I just wanted to pay attention. Okay, so now these are a set of uh, uh, studies that have been done in the past. Okay, so you do a meta analysis and then you arrive at a point estimate under 95% confidence interval. Now, this is the actual effect of the conventional treatment. Okay, and this is the outer bound of the confidence interval. Now, how do you select the margin for a non inspected trial? I blow this area off. Okay, so which is shown here. So you can see 20, 10, 30, 20, 10, 30. Okay, so in the worst case, the this treatment offers so much improvement over best supporting care or placebo or whatever. Now I want to do a non infinite trial of a new drug against this one. So what I want to decide is I want to decide what portion of this benefit I want to retain. Okay, and uh, there is a term for the uh, for that. I just uh, tell you a uh, preserved fraction. Okay, so preserved fraction. So what percentage of this benefit I want to retain? That is called as the preserved fraction. So once you know what is the preserved fraction, this total uh, benefit minus the preserved fraction will give you the non inferiority margin. So if the total benefit is ten. And you want to preserve seventy percent of that benefit in the new treatment, so then your non infinity margin will be only three. Okay, that's thirty percent. Okay, so that is how you define margins in the non infinity. Okay, so statistical analysis. Uh, I mean, all these are very standard. You don't do uh, two sided, uh, two one sided tests because there is only one sided hypothesis in the non infinity trial. And sample size depends directly on the margin. If the margin is very wide, your sample size is small. If the margin is small, your sample size is big. So this is once again the same way. How you know? Uh, uh, how do you recognize the problem? Uh, you know? Uh, how do you kind of select the control? What is the choice of intervention? This will be more, very obvious in the next slide. What is the secondary advantages, margin, and so on? Okay. And once again, you'll see that you know most of them should have reported there per protocol analysis. Okay, per protocol analysis is the way to go, especially in non-infinite trial. You have to report a per protocol analysis, but in addition, you may want to report a IDT also because most in general journals would not accept without a per protocol analysis for a non-infinite trial. So you now this is a vaccine example wherein you know 10% difference in uh, human conversion, uh, you know, zero conversion was uh, acceptable. But you can see that you know whether they received immunotherapy or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, the response rates were almost similar, with almost 97 to 100 percent of patients achieving antibody response as uh, uh, as against the control. Control 100 percent achieved antibody response, but even in those patients who were uh, undergoing chemotherapy or immunotherapy, there was a good number of patients achieving a uh, response and did not cross the non-infinity margin. So you can demo, you can say. That it does not matter if a patient is getting anything, you know, the chemo, you know, whatever, whatever, you can still vaccinate the patient, they will still get the immune response. The second example is uh, the duration of antibiotic treatment. Interestingly, what happened here is see, in the non infinity margin, one thing you must understand is non infinity margin is always on the side of the conventional treatment, not on the experimental treatment. Okay, so this is the conventional arm control. This is a conventional five-day treatment, and 
this one is the conventional fractionation so the margin is always on the conventional side because if it favors the conventional it means that you are not able to prove the unfair so therefore it should not favor the conventional beyond this line therefore the margin is always on the conventional side okay and here you see interestingly that your three day was doing better than the five day so non insanity was proved both by pp and uh, idt and here once again they have done an idt analysis and where they could demonstrate that hyperfractionation was not inferior to conventional fractionation okay. so that's about it uh, just to summarize so equivalence is either better or worse than the standard treatment but not the same okay and then you have only one margin and you apply to one sided test in non infinity trials it is not worse than an active control by more than a certain margin and you have to define m1 and m2 m1 is the maximum difference of the established treatment and m2 is the margin that you select for the n i based on the preserved fraction and uh, uh, you use a one sided uh, test for analysis of non infinity trials okay so with that i come to the end of my talks